Hi, property people. Thanks for joining us today. As always, we will be sharing ideas, experiences, problems, and solutions for property people like you. Our interviews will get you to know some of the most active professionals in the industry that have achieved some pretty impressive stuff. Hearing about their successes, failures, strategies, and insights, we really hope you enjoy. People. Today we are joined with Mr. Richard Thorpe. Uh, Richard is an ex-England international rugby player um, and has been part of the property community for a number of years. Um, so welcome to Property People. Richard, how are you today? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Sam. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Looking forward to it. Good, good, good. Well, um, certainly I think you're one of the most interesting people that I've had on um, property people simply because you've had a very uh how should i say a career that most people would have loved to have had um if they were to ha- have had one before they were in property um i would not have thought that if they actually had one <laughs> it's quite it's quite a challenging <laughs> it's not as yeah sometimes it's not as attractive as it is from the in, outside looking in <laughs> no i'm kidding it's, it's, it's been great <laughs> <laughs> very good well um what I always like to start with is um, to tell us a little bit about yourself, but really going all the way back to school, what kind of uh, person were you at school? I mean, to be in sports, you know, did you, were you super competitive? I normally ask people, what did you, what did you want to be when you grew up? You know, did you always want to get into property? But I'm assuming that you wanted to be a rugby player. So... I think to answer that question fully, I'll, I'll have to actually go all the way back to primary school. So as a, as a kid, um, five, six, seven, eight years old, um, despite being the biggest kid in the playground by a country mile, um, I was actually quite shy. I was quite reserved. Um, and it was when I was nine years old and I'd never played rugby. I'd never seen a rugby ball or, or anything really. I kind of seen this weird sport on television. Um, but uh, I mean, the game wasn't even professional back then. We're talking sort of 1992, 1993 uh, era. And uh, on the on the on my junior school training field, I was playing football, and I looked over, I saw another sport being played. I was like, "Gosh, what's that?" Um, asked the teacher if I could join in, and it, I just immediately took to it. I, w- I went home. My dad had been trying to get me into football for years, and I was just having none. I, I, just, I did football for me as, as a kid. Um, I just hated it. My brother was really good. He had played for England universities. Well, that was after this, this period, but he was always a good footballer. As a kid, I was on the sidelines of football games, um, watching my brother wrapped up in my dad's coat in a cold winter's day and, uh, and all of that. <laughs> um, grabbed a rugby ball and just immediately fell in love with the sport. So I went home that night and said, um, I actually said to my mum, Mum, I, I think I want to play rugby, but I don't want to disappoint Dad. So I, I, I'm not sure if I should carry on playing football. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, I mean, no, he, he took me straight out of a rugby club. And within a season, I'd made up my mind that I want to be a pro rugby player when I, when I grow up. I was 10 years old. Um, one of my brother's older friends, he's 10 years older than me, my brother. And one of his friends was a professional rugby player for Blackheath. Uh, right. Probably. And he came down to a training session. We're all 10 years old. And we look at this guy, he's six foot six, um, absolute mammoth of a man. And I just looked up at him and I was like, I want to be you one day. Um, and it, it, it just, the, the, the journey basically started then. Um, I was at a little state school in Bromley in Southeast London. Um, but I was really good at rugby. And um, through no real effort, it was just something I loved doing so much. That I'd be playing with a rugby ball all the time. I'd be out in the garden doing various bits of training and everything, but it was effortless. Um, I right. wasn't forcing myself to do something I didn't want to do. I wanted to go and do it. And at 13, I got offered a, um, a rugby scholarship to a, uh, a private school in Croydon called Whitgift. Um, and uh, at 13, I moved to Whitgift um, as the, the sport signing. Um, so I went there very much with everyone's perception of me. Richard, the rugby player, right? Wow. Um, so that just started to shape my own view of myself. I, I, I'm a rugby player. 
Uh, anyone asked me what I did at the age of 14, 15, I'm a rugby player. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. There was, yeah, there was just no pivoting away from it. And I mean, I had, I had some setbacks. I tried to get in England under the 16 team a year early, um, but didn't get selected. Hit me hard, but it, it didn't take me off the path. Got in the England 16s in my, in my correct age group and sort of moved through the England youth stuff. Um, and it, they were just... For me, that it was just—it was going to happen. I, I never yes. doubted it for a second. <laughs> so, do you, so, and I mean, that's why did you do it one year early? Is it so, you know? Because I, I have a lot of friends that used to play football, and they always used to do it simply to to play against the bigger guys. Because if you can handle yourself against people that are bigger than you, then you kind of you, you further yourself a bit faster. Was that the thinking behind doing that? Yeah, I, I suppose if you're the smartest kid in the year, they might put you forward a year and, and right. let you work with people that are actually at your, at your sort of level. And right. you can fall back to your own level with all of that experience. So it wasn't my call. It was one of our schoolmasters. So let's, let's put you. There's another player who was a very good player as well. Why don't you go for it? Go and play county a year up. And then we got into the divisional side. And it, it, it's sort of the, the, the promotion up until the England 16 group. And for me, I missed out on England 16s, but my, my, the guy that I did it with at school, a guy called Ross Broadfoot, very good fly half, uh, he made it. And that was, that was really tough at the time um, because I had all this expectation on me, this perception of who I was, so I didn't make it. Oh, geez, right. And it stung, it really stung. Um, I suppose if I, if I kind of refer to what I do now for a living, I'm a performance coach now, um, it's those moments where you kind of really find out about yourself. And so well, what are you going to do? It's only a failure if you give up, right? Tough, tough times maketh the man. And uh, it's how you bounce back from things, right? I suppose so, yeah. And in, in what, what position did you play as a rugby player? Well, I was a back row forward, so I played uh, flanker or number eight. So the forwards, they always in the hustle, the bustle, getting stuck in there. It's not a pretty job, is it, being the forwards? No, and, and particularly if you're in the back row. So we're, like the, we're the smallest ones in the forwards. So typically, you end up in the back row. If you're not skillful enough to be a back and you're big enough to be a forward, you end up in the back row. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be honest, I was a bit jack of all trades. I wasn't particularly skillful. Um, I, I wasn't particularly good at any, any one part. I just worked harder than everyone else, basically. Um, when I when I made my Premiership debut, I mean, I'd, I I could not have been physically fitter. I mean, maybe, right. maybe perhaps, but I'd done absolutely everything within the realms of possibility to get myself in absolute peak physical condition, so that I'm able to deliver out on the field against big battle hardened Premiership players and international players who obviously play in the English Premiership. Um, and, and, and then, uh, and, and one thing that I was thinking, to, you said you were at a state school because it's not really common for, for state school um, pupils to be getting into rugby or playing rugby um, and then moving over. How, how was that transition for you? Was that an easy thing because of the age you, you were quite young? Or? Do, you, do you know what? It's, it's quite a funny one, actually. So I, I went to a state school where everyone wore their tie like there. Everyone exactly. had buckles on their shoes. Everyone's shirt was untucked. Otherwise, you'd, you'd be having a scrap on the green at the end of the day. And someone would call you out in the corridor. It's fairly, it wasn't nuts, but it was, it was a bit rough. You know, there was, there yeah. was always a plan going on. And um, I mean, I'd, so I was playing cl club rugby for a local, a local team, Old Beckhamians. And uh, a schoolmaster from Whitgift just happened to be on the sideline. He approached my dad. Literally, it was that. They asked me to come down to the school for an interview. But I arrived, I arrived in February. Uh, so it, it wasn't at the start of the school year. It's a wit gift, right? Proper old, old school public school. And I've turned up. <laughs> <laughs> my shirt untucked and buckles on my shoes. But I'm this new kid, right? And it, it was so, it was tough for me. But the teachers accepted that it was going to be tough for me. Because the, this is a, an established um, group of 12-year-olds. Uh, yeah, I think we're tw uh, 11, 12 at the time. And um, I'm dropping into it uh, really hard in the middle of a school year. 
So they gave me a bit of leeway. So they told me to tuck my shirt in and correct my tie, but they let me keep the buckles on my shoes. <laughs> I'm the only person at the entire school with buckles on their shoes. Sounds nothing, right? But when you're a 13 year old kid, a 12 year old kid, you're suddenly the coolest kid in the playground. <laughs> anyway, I wasn't that guy, right? I, I, just, I wasn't. Reflect back to what I was saying about when I was younger. I was always a bit shy and a bit reserved. And it sort of like almost artificially put me at this, <laughs> at this sort of level. Um, and, uh, and yeah, being, being good at rugby helped as well. Well, I mean, it's like the American equivalent of being captain of the football team. It's, you're ever so popular, surely. Um, I mean, I mean, look, people will make of those sorts of titles what they'll make of it. Um, for me, the, the whole thing going through school was absolute dedication to becoming a pro rugby player. So I kind of glossed over all of that. I look back now, and I kind of, there's, there's part of me that slightly regrets not, may, maybe not using that uh, to my advantage. <laughs> so I'd, I'd stay in on Friday nights if we had a Saturday game. All my mates would be out partying. Um, I would... I'd, would rarely drink alcohol and, and all of that because I, I wanted to wake up and do an extra training session in the morning. So there, there was a bit of sacrifice at school, but it didn't feel like sacrifice at the time. It was just normal. It was just natural. Um, yeah, yeah. That makes and, sense. That, ma that makes sense. I think um, that's kind of indicative of, you know, you're a young pro and you've taken that through your, through your career. Um, I mean, in terms of your rugby career, what was the highlight of your rugby career um do you want one or how many can i have <laughs> um, <laughs> there's um the, the obvious ones are playing my first world cup game in 2015 what was then the millennium stadium against ireland um, that was that was a huge day uh winning the premiership with leicester tigers was a huge experience um, but probably my debut, my first game for London Irish at 20 years old, my, um, my opposite number was a fellow called Lawrence Delalio. He's a big name in rugby now. He's a big name, yeah, he's famous, yeah. Um, but he was my opposite number uh, playing for Wasps. And uh, I started the game. And in the first play, there was a scrum. Lawrence Delalio is picked and gone. And I'm, I'm now this young buck and I've got to take him down. The story that I give is I, I smashed him down onto the ground, ripped the ball off of him, and won a penalty, and I was an absolute hero, right? The reality is, <laughs> as, he, as he was about to make contact with me, and he's like, I can see it in his eyes. There's a part of me that's like, oh, God. the rest of me's like, come on in, let's go do it. <laughs> he actually lost his footing, right? And his head's gone down. <laughs> All I've had to do is just do that, stick him straight on the ground. He's in a completely compromised position. I almost fall over him, but the referee thinks that he's holding on and awards a penalty to us. So I stand up. It was on telly as well. So the commentators, the commentators said something like, um, oh, the old dog getting taught new tricks or something. <laughs> oh, I hold on to now. The whole thing was an absolute, like, like I just got lucky, right? If, had he not lost his footing, he would have driven me back 20 yards probably. Anyway. No, I, I prefer the former story. I definitely, I, I would stick with that one. And it sounds, I mean, just the way that you, the, the big smile that you've got on your face when you're talking about these fond memories, um, you know, all the hard work that you put in from a young age certainly seem worthwhile. But as, as we know, there's always going to be ups and downs through these journeys. What would you say was one of the hardest um, moments of your rugby career to deal with? Um, in 2012, um, I... So I've been at London Irish for nine seasons at this stage. Uh, if you play 10 seasons, you get invited to do a testimonial, uh, which is like, they basically dedicate a season to you as a thank you for putting a decade into your club. And I was on my ninth season, about to start my 10th. Contracted everything, ready to rock and roll. And uh, there was a change of management and the new director of rugby stepped in and he said, Thorpe, uh, we're not gonna keep you next year. We're, we're gonna end your contract, you're done. And he did that in April. So I didn't have much time to find another club. And that was gut-wrenching. Wow. And he, um, the reason he gave is, so he had stepped in for a couple of months. They'd sacked our previous DOR uh, for some poor, poor performances from the team. And he said, look, you just haven't been playing well enough over the last six months. And he was right. 
Um, so I, I went into no man's land for about a month uh, and then got picked up by Leicester Tigers, which was great. So I went to Leicester, really established club, right? And um, entered their pre-season, got in, started playing games for them. So I had my debut for North Am- um, against Northampton for Leicester Tigers, a couple of games in. Um, I got halfway through the season and I played about 10 games. The DOR calls me in, Richard Cockrell, and he goes, this is literally what he said, Thorby, why are you so shit? And ouch. I just, ouch, yeah. Uh, talk about a, a sort of downhill uh, thing, right? Um, so I said to him, look, my, I've got to be honest with you, Cocker, my arm really hurts. I got this knock a year ago um, to my arm. The physio said I'm okay. Um, but it still really hurts. So he goes, what, what arm? I'd passed their medical one way. So um, they hadn't picked it up. Sent me wow. for an extra. And my ulna, so you've got two bones in your forearm. Right? You've got your ulna, which is the thick one. And you've got your radius, which is your thinner one. My ulna was broken all the way through. Holy uh, shit. And I'd had it for a year. So where it had broken, I'd still been playing rugby. And it had just been doing this the whole time. And wow. a big lump you know, on, on my forearm. Um, but it was really hindering me. And being a stoical rugby player, as most of us are, you get on with it, right? Yeah. You snap your finger, your finger's sticking up like that on a game. The physio comes on, snaps it back into place, straps you up, you go and play again. You know, you, it's just what you do. Um, so it's, I not like the, it's, it's not like these football players who don't even need to be touched before they go down. Oh, fuck, oh, don't get me started. <laughs> um, so, I, so I then needed um, invasive surgery. So they had to... The, the bone had died. It closed over at both ends, the break. So the, the surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon, had to saw off the edges of the bone. They had to take a huge bone graft out of my hip, put a metal plate on. Wow. It was diagnosed a career and an injury. Um, but fortunately, seven months later, I made a return. Um, but at, at that stage, I'd moved from Leicester, who'd won the premiership, to London Welsh, who were the team that got relegated from the premiership. So I'd gone from the best to the worst. In one season. So that... That was probably the toughest time to sort of overcome. But it's, that's pro sport. It just it is what it is. You're not going to get through a, a pro rugby career without that sort of experience. Like any, any sport that you play, footballers will have their own challenges. You know, you don't, yeah, come, out, yeah. you don't come out this unscathed. Well, you, I mean, to have played for your country, uh, to have won the title, um, to have come as far as you, as you went, I think that's living most people's dreams. So... I have to congratulate you for that. I think that's amazing. Um, what we'd like to know, I guess, most is um, on this channel, how did property start becoming part of your life when, you, uh, when you're so focused on, on sports and, and health and fitness? Mm. So when I got my first um, proper contract in pro sport, you're, you're 21 years old and you're earning a lot of money. And um, relative to your peers, right? Not relative to footballers, but relative to your peers. <laughs> um, yeah. And it was 2006 or 2005 uh, for me. And uh, at that time, you could borrow 100% from the bank to go and buy a house. So I just went, absolutely. The reality, <laughs> you could self-certify what your, what your salary was. So I didn't even need the big salary. I could have done this anyway. But it was because I had a, a large salary. I thought, let's go get my property ladder. So I had the money to pay my legal fees, whatever that was, 5K, and went out and bought a house and lived in it for a year. Then, then we thought a mate of mine decided to go and rent a flat overlooking the Thames in Kingston. So pay a load of money for rent, stupid decision. And I rented out my house. <laughs> and suddenly I'm, I'm earning like two, 300 quid a month out of this, out of this house. It's just uh, organically, I just thought, Jesus, let's go and do this again. So I was able to get another one before 2008 happened. Um, went in a massive negative equity, obviously, during the financial downturn in 2008. But I was still cash flowing. So I'm looking at this thinking, like, I don't need to sell them. My tenants are still paying. Um, this is brilliant. Property is now cheap. <laughs> so <laughs> you carried on buying, right? So, uh, so during, the, during my sort of early 20s, I just built a portfolio of properties um, and started to really enjoy it, started to read around the subject, get a bit more educated around it, uh, joined some of the associations and, and all of that. 
And um, towards the back end of my career, I started to think, well, what, what do I want to do? Because it's a finite career. You don't earn enough money to retire, even if you did. So statistically, I don't know if you know this, but um, more than half of footballers go bankrupt within five years of retiring. So Holy moly, that's you want, terrible. You want long-term financial stability, the last thing you should be is a professional footballer, statistically. Wow. Uh, so fortunately, very fortunately, I wasn't a pro footballer. I was a pro rugby player. Um, and yeah, rugby players statistically will, will be considerably more financially healthy than footballers over the long term of their life. Um, Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Is there any reason behind it? Shit, there must be something. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, so I work in this space now. So I'm, I'm a transition coach for retiring pro athletes. So I've, I've worked with pro footballers who have gone bankrupt uh, to try and help them pick up the pieces from a cognitive perspective. And uh, I've, I've got a, CH, uh, um, a CAG in counselling as well. So helping guys that may be struggling with depression or anxiety disorder and so on. Um, the issues for footballers are that they're paid far too much money, far too young, and they don't have genuine counsel around them. They have parents whom have been promised things from agents. I mean, sadly, football agents probably at, at, at probably holding the most responsibility here. Um, they get in very young. They pay off the parents' mortgage for them. The parents think that they are now all going to be minted for the rest of their lives. The players thereby are earning so much more than their friends and their, and their family that they'll start putting their friends and family on like retainers. I've had, I've had stories where a footballer doesn't speak to his dad anymore because he had to stop paying his dad 20 grand a month. What? He paid 20 grand a month to have this lifestyle. Then it had all ended and his dad had taken out all of these things, living this lush lifestyle, leveraged to the hill. That all stopped, dad's gone bust, son's gone bust, and it's caused too much between them both for them to maintain a long-term relationship. And what needs to happen in football is have genuine counsel around these young men who are so vulnerable. You're vulnerable at that age with money. You're very vulnerable. Um, a charismatic, Guy can come in at the front of a room, sell a vision, sell a story, um, give you free cars, free boots, pay off mortgages and all of that. But does that, make, does that mean that they genuinely have your interests at heart? Um, that's been my experience from the work that I've done with footballers. Um, and I'm not saying that all agents are sharks. They're not. There are some very good ones. Um, but there are definitely some, some sharks in the water, sadly around vulnerable men. It, it's, I mean, it's not 100% surprising. You'd always think that, you know, where there's money, there's, and there's young people that maybe are not as sharp as, as, they, as they, you know, why would they be? They're young. You know, they, they, these footballers, I'm thinking that anywhere between 18 to 21, and they're already making six figures, um, so in some cases, a week. <laughs> it's like they're making crazy money. So, um, They've got to have a, a, a level of financial literacy, I guess. Um, that, and that's not provided, you're saying, by the, by the clubs, by their agents. Well, here's, and some here's, of here's where it becomes very, very tricky. The knowledge is there. It's all out there. Um, you can lead a horse to water, right? You can't force these players to go and learn financial literacy and to invest and to, to behave in a way that's going to give them long-term financial security. You can't force this upon the, these kids. Um, if, if I'm a young 21-year-old, I'm the one being paid, I'll do what I want, you know? Uh, they need convincing. And sadly, what convinces young men is dreams, is big stuff, shiny watches, uh, flash cars. That's what attracts and really fires up young men. So whilst the players have control of their own finances, I see it will be very challenging. Because the thing is, I've stood at the front of plenty of rooms full of young professional athletes. And I've said, I've said what the stats are. I've told them the reality, and I can see it in their eyes. And I know, I know it's there, because I was the same. That ain't gonna happen to me, mate. And yeah, this yeah. unbelievable self-belief 
that's a reason that they are the superstar that they are on the field. It's that same belief that actually hinders them in other areas of their life. Right. You know, I, know, I, know, I know all these guys go bankrupt, but it ain't gonna, I'm better. There's something different about me. You know, it's that, it's that sort of self-talk that, that sort of starts, can start people on that slippery slope. Yeah, so I, I think that they get so much um, adulation that they end up getting this kind of God complex that, you know, I can kind of, I'm invincible. I can, I can you know, I'm, I'm so good. I'll make up for it. I'll make more money or, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be, it won't happen to me type thing, um, which is quite common. So with you being that little bit older, a little bit wiser and certainly have been sensible with your finances and you've reinvested your capital um, and you've seen some good returns. So you've got a proven track record. Um, going towards these younger athletes, um, is it? Do you deal with them mainly before it's too late, as in when they're when they're actually young, or do you do you have to suddenly pick up the pieces when when they're already got nothing in the bank? Well, the thing is, so wherever you are in your own career as an athlete, um, there's still risk, right? So there's a proactive approach and a reactive approach. Sadly, I tend to work more reactively. Once the shit's hit the fan and right. problems are arising, that's typically when players would reach out to someone like me. Um, I do work proactively as well. Uh, so we guys that are in the throes of their career, they're loving life and uh, things are going really well. And um, I might work to give them, a, a, a say, a mental edge uh, on the field. Same what I do with property investors in my one-to-one -one coaching and executives and uh, family office members and so on who are the other the other groups that I coach uh, in my performance consultancy um, <clears throat> so if you look at the the proactive approach uh, this is probably in the last two to three years before you retire um, starting to ask yourself the question well what what am I going to do next what is it going to be what are the risks what's going to happen because here's the, the typical journey, and I, I won't, I've got a graph that I can screen share with you now. Um, typical journey, you retire from pro sport, you'll be up on a high. Um, mentally, life, everything else, hopefully, if you've chosen to retire. You might have got injured. Either way, you're gonna end, it's likely that you will, from, from like an overall well-being perspective, there's going to be a time when you really struggle. So more than half of professional rugby players more than half will develop either a depression or an anxiety disorder within two years of retiring. It's exactly the same in football. You are twice as likely to take your own life if you've ever played professional cricket. Uh, the stats are really, are really quite shocking. Um, so working proactively with players, they've got to know that. Because if you know that that's the stats, that's likely what's going to happen, uh, that, you, that, you're going to, that you're going to emotionally struggle, you can start to put things in place to ensure yeah. that you're able to smooth your own ride. Now that financially massive, huge thing, because earnings fall off a cliff for rugby players as well as footballers. Um, and uh, your relationships, the amount of footballers whom, I mean, what sort of, what sort of partner does a footballer attract? Big spender, can buy her anything that she wants, um, the lifestyle that she becomes accustomed to. What do you think she's going to do when the money's not there anymore? Uh, is she going to stand by you when you're a painter and decorator and you've lost, you don't have anything anymore other than some pictures, trophies, um, and the odd person that still remembers who you are down the pub? Uh, is she still going to be with you? So those sorts of considerations towards the back end of your career getting good people around you, your friends. Why have your friends hung around with you? Can they afford the, the, the 10 grand bottles of um, champagne in the nightclubs? Um, right? Are they still going to be there when you're a painter decorator or whatever it is that you, you move into? Um, start to ask yourself, get some awareness around reality. Because here's the thing, pro sport, you're in a bubble. You're not in reality. No matter how much money you earn, I was never a massive earner, a rugby player, I was in a bubble. And when that burst, when I retired, I chose to retire, but the bubble still got burst and I still had a, a crisis of identity. Like, who am I now? Um, 
from the age of 10, I'm a pro rugby player. Now I'm not anymore. My whole hard wiring, my, those formative years in your early teens where you, all your um, neural pathways are getting created, your brain's fully developing, you've got this unshakable belief that I'm a rugby player. Bang, that's not the case anymore. So fortunately, I built a property investment company. It was going really well. Um, uh, I actually, so for the last two years, I've sidestepped, sidestepped out of property day to day. Uh, my brother runs our, our, um, our property company and we've got our team up in Knightsbridge in our office there. And I do day to day, I do uh, opportunistic business development. Um, when, so we lend money, basically. So my property business now is we lend money to property developers. And uh, I'll do opportunistic business development. But really, I'm a performance coach because that's what I love. And I found my new sort of passion. You see what I mean? so, that's um, brilliant. That's brilliant. I mean, in terms of the um, performance coach, I do want to come back to that because I think that that's hugely uh, important, especially in tough times like now where certain businesses are struggling. I think it, uh, a lot of uh, success is, does, but it's my personal opinion that it boils down to the mindset of the individual. Um, yes, you've got to have some skills and some knowledge, and uh, but I think if you don't have the right mindset, it's really, really hard to be successful or have success because usually that, that poor mindset, it means that when the problems come and they will come, uh, you, you, it knocks you and you either pivot too far and you deviate and you stop doing what you're doing, you try something else and, and you never get to quite. So I think that that is really, really, and then coming from somebody like yourself who has been a high performance athlete, um, you certainly have that mindset. And you can, But very quickly before we go into all of that, because as I said, I really like that side, that topic. Um, the lending on property. Tell us a little bit about that. What, what, how is it bridging? Is it uh, what kind of is it a mortgage brokerage or are you an actual lender? How does all that work? So, towards the back end of my career, taking the proactive approach, I like was seeing earlier on, um, I decided to move into property development. So, uh, myself and my brother uh, formed um, a property development company. We call it a property investment company actually because we were managing our respective portfolios and a few, other, a few other bits and pieces. Uh, we're doing a bit of brokering um, as well with some big deals. Um, but uh, we moved into property development. We were on Homes Under the Hammer and uh, did, did little bits like that. But we learned pretty quickly that to, do, to be a property developer at a, at a, at a larger scale, um, there's a lot of risk. Um, you've really got to know what you're doing. And we weren't second generation property developers. Like, we're smart people, but we're inexperienced and we saw the opportunity pretty quickly to start backing experienced property developers so within within our respective networks i was doing a lot of networking at that time i was presenting at all sorts of events up in london and, and so on on all sorts <laughs> um but we met some really good developers and we had some some capital behind us uh and we started lending we started bridging um but it's a race to the bottom, has been for years now in the bridging market. Yeah. If you're a bridging lender, you just don't have that much money because <laughs> so many people do it. Um, yeah. And uh, we did a bit of equity lending, so uh, higher risk again, but we've offset the risk, the risk that we would have in uh, putting equity into our own deals by putting it into an experienced developer and putting it with an experienced developer. Um, but again, with where we were at, at, at the time, our sort of our risk appetite, we started to bring on capital from um, from other people, from uh, private investors and family offices, and so on. Um, and we started to see the the opportunity in the mezzanine space. So we started we started lending mezzanine loans, second charge loans uh, to experienced developers. Uh, 200 250k average ticket size um and started to build a build our book and build our track record and the more track as you'll know the more track record you get the more investable you are and ultimately in that game you look to bring on more and more external capital so that you can just do things at a bigger scale um, so where we started lending 100k um we're we're lending sort of up up to sort of a million into any one deal at any one time um and uh and that's sort of been our our property journey 
to date. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, uh, the lending and finance space uh, is, is really tough to navigate. Um, I mean, the level of due diligence. You were saying that, you know, you, you don't know, you don't have the same experience as a second generation developer, but you almost need to know as much as they would do to, to be able to allocate that capital. Yeah, you don't take the first loss position, but um, it's still, uh, there's still a huge responsibility, especially if you're taking on other people's cash and, and deploying it for them. Uh, mm -hmm. that there is a huge responsibility, but I do agree with you that um, bridging over the years has, the margins have been squeezed, the supply has increased significantly, and it's interesting. I mean, do you still do any equity at the moment, or have you, are, you, are you kind of nice now comfortably just doing MERS? I mean, so as a, as a business, we do MERS. That's, that, that's, our, that's, right. that's our, um, our, our business. Um, we, yeah, I mean, like, off the side of that, yeah, do the odd bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair play. Um, you can't be all things to all people all the time, all right? So for me, my real passion now is, is coaching. I mean, I'm also a director of rugby at a National One Rugby Club, you know, RFC, all behind me. Um, you can't do everything. You can, you can have anything you want in life, but you can't have everything you want in life, right? So for, for me at the moment, I've, I've pivoted out of property day to day. Um, I mean, look, I, I do a lot in the family office world, um, in their communities, and I'm, I'm an ambassador for um, a group called the Global Next Gen Community. Um, so that's the um, so sort of like the next generation of family office um, principles, uh, young entrepreneurs, but they've, they've made significant capital and so on. So I, I, within those spaces, whilst mostly it's all set up as a support network and so on, there's, there's collaboration to be made. We co-fund regularly with other family offices. Um, and that, that can look very different from just clean MES, which is our yeah, primary. Yeah. So, that um, makes sense. That makes sense. That may, and and I, I just love the, the array of different things that you've done and you seem to have done them all sensibly and, and gone from one thing nicely to another. And going back to the performance coaching, mm. I mean, you certainly sound like you've got the right mindset um, to, to be successful in, in whatever you do. You seem to have a, a kind of firm head on your shoulders. Um, with performance coaching, what is it the, that you like the most about it? What, what, where, do you, you know, where do you see the most gratification for yourself? Um, I saw a stat. I haven't been able to find it again since. Uh, I think I saw it on Facebook. I mean, for me, maybe it's... <laughs> Maybe it's my reticular activating system kicking in, right? That's the thing that makes you, if I tell you yellow car, you'll go out and you'll just see yellow cars everywhere. Or you get a new <laughs> car and everyone's wearing it, right? It's your, it's your, you can only focus on so much. And your reticular activating system is the part of your brain that does that. I see life coaches everywhere now. It's like <laughs> everyone is calling themselves a coach. And, oh, yeah, I do life coach, particularly in the property space as well. Um, I mean, this has been going for a long time now. You, you'll it seems quite typical that someone will enter property, go on a course, and rather than go out and actually become a property investor, they'll start their own course and start training other people. At when the age of 21 usually as well. Sorry? At the age of 21 when they've barely had uh, enough life experience to really be yeah. able to understand what it's all about. So. And this, when I saw this stat, I just wasn't surprised. So 98% um, of coaches are out of business within two years because they just can't earn enough money. They can't find enough clients. Uh, out of the 2% that make it, um, less than 20% will ever make more than 30 grand a year out of it. So if you look at you guys that have, that have created serious coaching businesses, that they're in the, they're in the minority. Um, and what I'm seeing more and more now is coach training. Uh, come and become a coach. I'll teach you how to do it. And my only, my immediate thought there, why do you need to coach other coaches? Why don't you go out and coach people? Um, well, it's hard to find these clients. You've got to have a USP. You've got to be very clear, not only about who you are, but about who you coach and why you are different from anyone else out there. If you don't have that, you're not going to be successful. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to stumble into 
maybe stumble into it isn't, isn't quite fair, but um, I, I've got absent sort of a very clear group that I that I tend to work with. Um, athletes in their transition, not many people doing that. Um, uh, the next generation family offices. There are a few that operate in that space, but not many. Uh, and then I work with executives. So typically uh, your partners in law, in law firms, accountancy firms, but um, guys that have really hit the corporate world because um, they like the pro athlete edge. What can I learn from a pro athlete type thing? And there's a lot of transferable skills there. Um, more and more now because I've got a big network in property. I, I coach a lot of property investors as well. But, um, but that's sort of because I've been a property investor, I've got a lot of experience. I mean, let's make one thing clear, though. I mean, coaching isn't advice given. So I, 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 I've coached property investors that know me through the property investment community, and they're, they're thinking that they're going to get some investment advice and so on. I mean, but whilst we may end up discussing something like that, that's not really what coaching is. Coaching is about changing the person. Right? If, if, you, if there's not something about you that you don't want to change, you don't need a coach, right? And I'm quite clear about that. And I'm quite, uh, I wouldn't say I'm ruthless with it, but um, upfront, before I agree to take on a coaching client, they have to convince me that they're motivated to change themselves. Otherwise, it ain't gonna work. And we're just gonna go around in circles. That's so true. Um, <clears throat> I've got, for example, a friend uh, who's, uh, 29 years old so he's getting to that age of 30 where he's thinking shit I gotta take life a little bit more seriously and I need, you know I don't have anything and he's got a little bit of debt to his friends he it doesn't feel like debt because it's not to a bank or a credit card but it's to friends so he's in debt um, and he's and he's a sales guy so he should be making good money but then he's kind of a victim to the market because when things are going great he makes a fortune but when things aren't going so great he doesn't know which, you know, he's going from one job to the next, just trying to make it through with the basic salary. And so yeah. he's completely torn. If you came across somebody like that, what would you say to them or how would you approach that person? Um, so uh, there's no one size fits all approach with coaching because every single person on the planet is completely unique. There has never been someone like you with your experiences, your belief systems and everything else ever. There's never been someone that's the same as you. So you can't have a one size fits all approach. You have to take each person as they come. And in doing that, I mean, I, so I've, whilst I, I've been a coach for three years, for the last two years, I've, I've, so I've, I'm qualified as, a, um, as an executive coach. I'm accredited with relevant bodies and so on. But I've, the, the overriding philosophy that I've, I've come to found to be the most effective at creating change in people is uh, cognitive behavioral theory. So that, that's looking at how we think. And you've used the term mindset quite a few times on this call. Yeah. And the coach in me, I've held myself back. I really want to say, <laughs> ask me, so what's mindset to you? To okay. Okay, let me, let, me, let me try to answer that question. Mindset is a way of thinking. It's kind of, uh, you know, mindset is, to me, the way I understand it is no matter what happens, no matter how rainy it gets and dark and cloudy, I know that the sun's going to shine again. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like that mindset. And some people are like, no, the rain's out. It's, you know, it's never going to be sunshine again. It, that's it. Mm -hmm. It's over. So that's mm. kind of how I, how, but yeah, tell me what you what you were going to say. <laughs> you see, what I, what I wish I'd done, because this is obviously a podcast, what I wish I'd done before you answered that would be to ask the listeners to this right now, to stop the, stop the recording and write down your definition of mindset. And I guarantee there wouldn't be a single one that was the same as yours. Oh, shit. <laughs> We'll have to do that in the next one. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody is different. So I could then pull any single one of those listeners' um, definitions, read it out, and there wouldn't be a there wouldn't be one that's identical. Because everyone's got a different perception of what mindset is. Everyone's got a different right. perception of the world. Everyone's got a different perception of themselves. So 
what we tend to find, and this is this is now cognitive behavioural um, theory starting to kick in, is that we're we're a product of our experiences, uh, who we are, what our childhood was like, what our adolescence was like. Um, those formative years create our belief systems, um, what we think about ourselves, what we think about the world. Uh, if you have ever said something along the lines of, "This always happens to me," or "Gosh, I'm just not good enough," or uh, any sort of limiting sort of belief. It's likely that there was, there's a pattern that happened in your past or in a specific moment that's formed that. And it was probably true then. And it's not necessarily true now. So someone who say, let's take you're a property investor and you know you've got to pick up the phone and speak to a lender or speak to someone that you're quite nervous to speak to. Um, Gosh, I've got to do a good job. Gosh, what if I say something stupid? Gosh, oh, this, all this self-talk starts to happen. And I mean, I've had, I've had this with so many clients now. They don't pick up the phone. Or they spend so long, they work themselves up into this frenzy. They finally answer the phone and, and they're almost more likely to say something silly. <laughs> or they get to the end of it and they're like, gosh, that was nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. You think of the emotional cost that's gone into that. And my curiosity there is why did you have to feel that way in the first place All right was any of that true i'm not good enough why, why aren't you good enough i want to know i want to understand that because maybe you are and very often what we tend to find is that people during the course of a coaching program their entire perception of themselves shifts and they go they move away from saying things such as well i can't do this or good things things like this never happen to people like me or um, whatever it might be to more sort of growth mindset, curiosities and questions. How can I do this? What, who would I need to become to deliver that? And how do I get there? How do I go and become that person? That, that's the stuff that will actually move you forward in your life. Not getting anchored to limiting beliefs, which we all have, right? It's only when we look inside and start trying to understand them that we can, pick them apart and say, hang on a minute, we shouldn't actually be here anymore. <laughs> um, you look at uh, like the mind traps. Have you ever heard the word, have you ever heard the word catastrophize before? Not, not, not catastrophize. So this would be, is a, is a great example of this, right? Uh, you knock over the sugar in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a Costa coffee and you think, gosh, I'm so stupid. God, what do all these people think of me? Gosh, I'm just no good at anything, am I? God, do you know what? I bet, I bet I don't get that deal later on today. And if I don't get that deal, I'm not going to have enough money. Then the wife's going to leave me. And then when she, once she's left me, now I'm going to lose the house. I'm going to end up homeless, right? It's catastrophizing. Tiny little thing. And you turn a mountain into, a molehill into a mountain, right? In terms of a problem. Um, it's, it's a mind trap, right? All you've done is knock over the sugar. It, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> You just put the sugar back up, put it on there, ah, silly me, and, and get on with your life. So catastrophizing, a lot, a lot of people can. Um, we, so, 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 see, some people, that's what I'm saying. Some, so, that, so what would you call that, those people that do that? You know, I would say that they have, right for the wrong, but I would say that they have a poor mindset. Is that right for me to, to describe, them, uh, describe that as that? Um, I, I suppose by your definition of mindset, um, it would be. I mean, I would define mindset as um, the state of your mind. You, you're not actually defining what, but by saying, just using the word mindset. Right, right, right. The, the, the state of your mind, what you, what you choose, how you choose to think and how you choose to react to certain situations. There's no definition necessarily that needs to come with it. Um, can you have an outstanding mindset but still catastrophize? I mean, like, why do we catastrophize? Um, this, is, this is part of our, our journey as humans, right? We go back a thousand years, catastrophizing could have saved your life. Uh, if I go around that corner, there might be a bear there and he'll eat me and my family, so I'm not gonna go around the corner. Very, very likely there wasn't a bear around there. Um, but the, our ancestors that survived didn't go around the corner. The ones that yeah. would always go around the corner, the, the, the one out of 10 gets eaten. 
Do you know, I mean, this is why it's hardwired into our autonomic nervous system, our fight or flight response, right? It's innate within us. And we live in an, in an environment now, modern, the modern world is just completely different from what we're built to live in. You know, with anxiety, everyone, everyone's trying to reduce anxiety now. Crucial for our survival a few hundred years ago, a few thousand years ago. If, if you had no anxiety, you probably were killed before you could procreate. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, it's, it is something instinctive that we have this, um, this nervousness, this anxiety to try and keep us safe, I guess. It's been probably there for thousands of years. And we try to, more in these days, try to control it in some way, shape or form. Um, I mean, does this personal coaching go into business coaching as well? So, for example, somebody that's just focused purely on money and you think, well, maybe you should be thinking a little bit more, step, taking a step back and thinking about relationships. Do you go into that level of thinking as well for certain people? Well, my question, if someone says, I, I want to make as much money as I can, oh, love it. Love it when someone says that. So tell me more. Why do you want to make as much money as you can? Well, then they go, well, they, then they start saying things like, oh, I want to go on holiday. I want a big car. And I would like to, you know, own a building and I yeah. want to retire early. All the kind of cliche, mm -hmm. obvious stuff. Ultimately, it's to lead to what? Uh, <laughs> obviously, not one of those people, but uh, I guess that you, 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 I, you try and get to the point of what's driving that. What's the driver? Yeah. What's driving this need to make as much money as you can? Are you trying to prove something to someone else? Is it the kid in the playground that used to bully you? Are you actually, are you trying to make money to show him that you've made it, even though you haven't seen him for 30 years? That, this happens, right? My wife's going to leave me unless, I, unless I've got shit loads of money. Are, are you sure? Because <laughs> um, we can get caught in these traps. I mean, my, my, my question always is, why? Why, why is making money so important? Um, usually someone will center on, well, I, I'm, if I've got passive income, if I'm able to take regular holidays, if I'm able to live in a lovely house, I've got my vision board with all my cars on it that I want and nice watches, and everyone's gonna think I'm successful and blah, blah, blah. At that point, what's happened? Once you've got all of that, where have you arrived? Have you self-actualized? And now you're just like the most complete person that you could be is it just you want to be happy i mean if you want to be happy move to africa statistically they're happier than americans you're more you're you're twice as like no 10 times as more likely to commit suicide if you're in, if you live in america versus then if you live in africa so if it's happiness you want don't go after money i know the stats of high net worth individuals um i, I work in the family office the ultra high net worth community they struggle more with their mental health than middle class people. If you, want to, if you want to have sound mental health, don't chase money, whatever you do. It's the same stats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Similar, similar philosophy with um, footballers. So what I, would, what I would suggest, and here's where we tend to get to, but it's usually a young buck, right? Comes out, and I was the same, right? As a 21, 22 year old. I want, I want a Ferrari, I want this, I want that, I want the other, blah, blah, blah. Brilliant. Go and have the journey. Great. Have the failures along the way as well, though, because that's, that's what really shapes you. And yeah. where, we tend to, where we tend to align ourselves um, in, a, in a coaching um, journey between me, and a, between me and a client is to, if money is still your goal by the end of your coaching, you have absolute clarity of why it's your goal. You understand it. You're completely aware of why that's your goal. And it's not, there's not a subconscious driver that's sending you in that direction. Because if you let, what we can find is if we let our subconscious drive our decision making, we can set ourselves up for failure. And, and those can be hard ones to pick ourselves back up from. Let's know ourselves. Ultimately, coaching is about knowing yourself and becoming your own coach. Um, and I mean, in terms, in terms of, um, because that, I mean that that's hugely powerful what you've just been saying, in terms of the physical and and then mental like physical fitness, would you say that that's um, goes hand in hand? You know, is it important to do a little bit of both to to really get a good equilibrium, a good balance? Yeah, 
Um, it, ever heard the phrase, if you don't use it, you lose it? Yeah. Yeah. That's basically the human body, right? Um, I've just taken, I've just led a, an expedition over the three peaks uh, last Saturday. And um, I took a, a, a technical advisor with me who I've known for a long time. He's 73 years old, uh, ex special forces, and a hell of a man. Um, 73, he's leading us up these mountains. It, the shape on this guy, he's got chest out here, arms out here. Loving life, because he's used he's used his body all his life. He hasn't stopped, and I've seen so many rugby players who retire within two or three years. They're so out of condition and they can't move anymore. Yeah, I've seen other rugby players who have retired with awful injuries, but they've been able to overcome it, and now they're climbing mountains themselves. Um, you've got to use your body, and there is a direct link between your cognitive performance and your physical fitness, that they are directly linked. The fitter you are, the sharper your cognition is. That's your thinking. More, cl more, more clarity of thinking. Um, this, is, this, 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 this makes complete sense to me. Um, I, 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 I always feel that when I've got a problem on my shoulders, uh, I go out for a run or I go out for a walk and suddenly I'm thinking a lot more clearly and I've got a few solutions and usually one of those is exactly the one that I go with and everything ends up being fine. Um, Richard, I could speak with you, I think, forever. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I think we've got a lot more to talk about from um, your rugby career. I'm sure there's many more tales. Uh, your property stuff, you go and dive into a bit deeper one day. Um, and certainly this performance stuff, I think that it's, it's something that more people need to um, subscribe to in one way or another because I really think it helps keep people healthier both mod body and mind so before I let you go tell us a little bit about Chino RFC so um, Chino, Chino Rugby Club play in level three so it's national one so it goes to premiership championship national one all our players are part-time so we train two evenings a week but everyone's paid if you play um, so it's a, it's a part-time role that I, I have as director of rugby. So I'm ultimately responsible for all rugby at Chino. And we go all the way down through the age groups to rugby tots. So I'm now, I like to think of myself as CEO of a 500 person organization because it's, it kind of feels like that, <laughs> um, albeit, albeit it's part-time. So we are currently recruiting. We've, um, we've just completed our coaching team. So in our coaching team now at Chino, uh, we've got, uh, 600 premiership games between our coaches. Uh, I think we've got over 50 international caps between us. Um, so we've got Delon Armitage, who's the ex-England uh, too long fullback. Uh, we've got Sawani Tongawea, the ex-Tongan international, and used to play for Northampton Saints. He played 200 games for Northampton Saints. And, and, um, and uh, Craig Hampson as well, and Bristol. So we're, we're in really good shape. And we've got our play. I mean, we're navigating through COVID at the moment. We've got no idea when our first game's going to be, but training is on tonight in socially isolated little groups and <laughs> sanitizer stations and all of that. So we're keeping it fun. We're keeping it, keeping everyone's uh, engines firing. Um, so that basically, whenever we get to our first game, we're ready to play. Richard, I love your energy and your zest for life. It's, uh, I hope it's contagious. It certainly is for me. If people wanted to reach out to you um, to discuss any of the topics we've, we've been speaking of what's the best way they can reach you um i mean frustratingly i've been building my new website as many people have for like the last six months which isn't quite complete yet but that will be richard thorpe.com um for now uh contact me through social media richard j a thorpe uh, on all social media handles it's pretty easy uh give me a follow as well hopefully you're back and um yeah it's probably the easiest way Great. And we'll keep the links in the show notes. Thank you ever so much for joining us, Richard. Have a great day. Yeah, cheers, Sam. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in today. We've got lots more super active property people coming up. So keep up to date. Click the subscribe button. Hit the bell icon. Leave us a comment share us and find us across social media and we'll see you next time